Let us start this service with the words from Howard Thurman. I share with you the agony of your grief. The anguish of your heart finds echo in my own. I know I cannot enter all you feel nor bear with you the burden of your pain. I can but offer what my love does give. The strength of caring, the warmth of one who seeks to understand the silent storm swept barrenness of so great a loss. This I do in quiet ways that on your lonely path you may not walk alone. Today we have come to mourn the death and celebrate the life of Steve Anthony Campo. He was a son, a father, a musician, a husband, a cook. Uh, just some logistics very quickly. His, we have copies of his order of service, but most of them for you are just on the website. If you want to follow along with what's happening, you can do it there. Now, some would say that Steve lived a long life, and others might say that he died too soon. Both are right. Some will say that his death started with dementia, and others will say that he was there until the end. Both are right. Some will say he was a loving, compassionate man, and others have said that he was complicated with anger. Both are right. Some are sad for this new hole in their lives. Others feel blessed and overjoyed to be a part of Steve's life. Both are right. Just as we all are, Steve was a complicated person, and by that I mean he was a human being. And as such, we are all complicated. I never got to know Steve before he was struck with dementia, so I cannot tell you what he was like before the disease. I can only piece together piece that together from stories of what he was like before that. I did know him as a singer and a frequent worship attender. We are not simply us at our best. We are us when we are sad or angry or depressed. We are us when we are babies and teens and parents and grandparents, and we are ourselves when we are asleep just as much as we are awake. And so Steve was as much himself before the disease as after. Here are the three things I want you to know about this service. First is it is okay to laugh. No one who ever lives should die without being celebrated, and celebrating Steve's life may include laughter. That's okay. The second is we will fail. There is no way in this hour we will ever fully retell the story of who Steve was at least not here, not from the pulpit. Steve will be retold through you. As you experience your loving thoughts of him, when you hear a story or a song or think of something that reminds you of him, your brain will fire off the same endorphins it did when he was alive. For this hour, as you hear stories, physiologically, Steve will be alive in you. Third, we cannot make any promises about the afterlife. I cannot tell you that he is in a better place. I cannot tell you that he is in heaven or hell. I simply do not know. I know that some people here today have strong beliefs of the afterlife, and others believe that there is no afterlife. So while we cannot tell you where Steve is right now, we can tell you what his afterlife is right here. And by that I mean what life after Steve looks like. Steve was a band director. That means the music he made, not by playing, but by allowing other people to make their music. Well, that music didn't stop existing. Those compressed sound waves are out there somewhere in the world. They don't resemble what they did, what they did then, but they are still there. I do not know right now where Steve's soul is. But I know that he was loved and he will be missed. I know that he will live on in people's memories and in their actions. I know that he will live on when people cook like him or make music or attend a baseball game. We know that Steve's body was made up of holy stuff. When the universe exploded so many billions of years ago, Stardust splattered all over the universe, and atoms collided into each other over and over and over indiscriminately. 
And one day those atoms collided in such a way to create Steve. For the next 83 years, he wandered this earth. He brought more music into the world. He brought more joy into the world. And after all of these years, the stardust that have made up Steve, well, they have dispersed. They have moved on to form other things. But the life he lived, the love he freely gave, will live on through his memory, through every good deed and loving thought done in his honor. We have a ritual in this church where we light a chalice to start a service like this. Um, Quindlin, would you like to light the chalice? And would you say with me, with hope to make this a better world, we light this flame. Its light is the symbol of the power of love. Right where you're seated, we'll do this next hymn. By Wendell Berry, the longer we are together, the larger death grows around us. How many we know by now who are dead, we who are young now count the cost of having been. And yet, as we know the dead, we grow familiar with the world. We who were young and loved each other ignorantly now come to know each other in love, married by what we have done as much as by what we intend. Our hair turns white with our ripening as though to fly away in some coming wind, bearing the seed of what we know. It was bitter to learn that we come to death as we come to love, bitter to face the just and solving welcome that death prepares. But that is bitter only to the ignorant who pray it will not happen. Having come the bitter way to better prayer, we have the sweetness of ripening. How sweet to know you by the signs of this world. So the way we're going to do this eulogy is we're not going to tell Steve's story in chronological order. We're going to just offer some snapshots of who he was. Uh, we can't do it in this hour anyway. So we're going to invite Paul to come up first and then Gwendolyn. Um, so if you would like to come and Tell a story of Steve. Thank you. <clears throat> Didn't uh, draw out a whole speech today. I just wanted to say that in, in my life, if it were not for my dad, I would not be here, nor would the five brothers and sisters that I have. Through the times of what's been going on, 
Through the pandemic, I find a lot of people at a loss and separated from each other. I also find that they've lost their way from Christ because it doesn't matter what our differences are, the Christ is the only way. So none of us are just, none of us are good. We all have to ask him for forgiveness to make our way. So I just wanted to speak a little bit about some of the times that we had, some of the fishing trips um, one of my dad's favorite places in freshwater was a place called Zigzag Canal uh, in Stevensville and Bell River area. And I recalled the time that we went fishing and we were having a great day. It was a great place to fish, lots of bass. And I cast a jointed back minnow bait and it never landed. And of course, dad said, what are you doing, son? And I said, well, I'm fishing. And dad said, for what, birds? An owl had swooped down, grabbed the bait before it hit the water and landed in a tree. So I'm staring at the owl, wondering, okay, this is an expensive bait. Dad's not gonna be happy if I lose his bait. The bait made it back to the boat safely. And 10, 15 minutes later, I switched baits to a worm and threw over a big giant log longer than the boat. And dad says, what are you doing, son? I said, I'm fishing. And he says, um, over an alligator longer than the boat. And I said, oops. So the moral to the story basically is that we all make mistakes as we grow. All we can do is ask Jesus for forgiveness and move on with our lives. Um, holding on and not asking for forgiveness of one another is to me one of the greatest travesties in this world. And I see too many people doing it right now. And I just want to pray that all of us come together and realize that we do have differences, but we have one thing in common, that's Jesus. And that's the only way. So... Thank you for the life that I got to share with my dad. I see many out there that do not have dads and do not and have not had the things that I've had. It might seem small, but to me it's great. And I choose to look at the joy that we had because nothing's perfect. There weren't always happy moments, but compared to all, I had a great life. Thank you. Before I get started and before I forget, out on the table are part of Steve's baseball caps. And um, please take one or two. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do with them all. When Steve had Alzheimer's, coming to church was one of my favorite things because I could feel everybody sympathizing with me, knowing where I, what was happening and supporting me. Even if I didn't know them very well, I knew that's what they were. And one time or two, somebody came by and said, hi, Steve, and then just kept on walking. And Steve said, they know me here. Steve was a gregarious clarinet player, band director, guidance counselor, Italian, and fisherman. He loved to tell stories and make people laugh. One of his favorite ones was about his older sister, Sarah. She was sitting on the front porch uh, with her boyfriend and, uh, the Campo family has uh, kind of inherited some um, 
digestive problems. Um, and her father, of course, in those days, the windows were open and all that stuff. Her father let go a monstrous fart. And poor Sarah was so embarrassed. Steve was born in a meat to immigrant Italian strawberry farmers. When Steve was six, I think, the family moved to Baton Rouge because his father got a job at Standard Oil. When he was a teenager, his father died of a heart attack as he came in the door from work and went to take a nap. Of course, those days, we didn't know as much about heart disease. He was the only of his six siblings that went to college, and that was because his Sarah, his sister Sarah, encouraged him, that's a mild word, to do his homework and practice his clarinet because she wanted him to go to college. He did follow his Scatoni uncles in his love for music and playing an instrument. They were instrumental in getting him uh, clarinet lessons by a LSU clarinet professor. He did really well playing the clarinet so well that he was chosen to play the solo in Claren Mozart's Clarinet Concerto at a state band competition. Well, before he started, he fainted. But the people around him encouraged him, and he carried on and um, received an outstanding, um, I think you call it rating. And if these things are what, no doubt, what got his music scholarship to LSU and his place in the Tiger Band. He was so proud of being in the Tiger Band. That was just a really important thing to him. And that's why we went to every Tiger Band reunion there was. He loved marching on the field. Although he told me one time that he really wasn't playing the clarinet. He was just holding it up to his mouth to look like he was playing it. Steve had six children, as Paul told you. Six children on a teacher's salary. Have, of course, his wife Clara was working as well, but that wasn't enough, so he sold shoes at Gotcha's, and then later he worked at the library. But he found enough time to teach his kids to fish, water ski, and he took them on vacations, camping, of course, not hotels, to national parks. Fishing was Steve's passion. He would get up at 3 a.m. to drive down to Bell Roads or Stephenville to um, be on the water at daybreak. I, I didn't go with him on those. For a while, he had a hard time getting people to go with him. Well, I guess not if you get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, but mostly because the game warden was, like, always there. He was at the... Every time Steve would come back to the boat ramp, the game warden would be there. He would be out fishing. The game warden would show up. I think maybe he did have one over, 
redfish over or under whatever the size they were supposed to be. I never objected to him going fishing. He caught the fish, he cleaned the fish, and he cooked the fish. He fried them and he blackened them. They were delicious. And all, his, all of his friends knew that it was going to be a royal treat if he cooked the fish. He walked the line in 79 when the teachers were on strike. He was the head of the teachers association or union or whatever it was at that time and was head of the negotiations. And I'm not sure how the negotiations came out, but he made a, lo a lot of people angry. And so I think that was one of the reasons why he never got assistant principal or principalship. One year we went to Italy to visit our cousins. He spent the previous year learning Italian because he wanted to be able to talk to them. And, you know, most of them that we visited knew a, little, a good bit of English, but the ones in Bologna, nothing. But he soldiered through and we stayed there two days and a night but when we got home, he knew a lot more Italian than when we left. Baseball, I got Steve interested in baseball in the early 90s, and we got, we've had see, season tickets since then. He liked the excitement and the interaction with his friends of baseball. I liked the mechanics of baseball. We went to all the home games and quite a few away games. We went to Houston to see the game with Rice, and normally you can get some tickets when you get there, but this time you couldn't. It was sold out. And um, so we thought, well, that's that. But we got a rumor that after the game, there were some tickets available. Not very expensive, very inexpensive. So we bought one, bought two. They were behind the outfield fence. But they did give us some chairs to sit in. The first time, I think it was the first time we went to the College World Series was the infamous Warren Morris walk-off home run to win the national championship. And another time we went to the College World Series, we got to the final game, there was just one then, and all of the LSU tickets had been taken by people that donated more than us. So our friends and us sat in line all night to be at the box office so that we could get tickets. We got them. On a more tender note, Steve often told me that he loved me. And as his dad said to his mom, he, that he told me that I was as beautiful as the day he married me. With his, even with his Alzheimer's in the beginning, he would often tell me that he didn't know what he would do without me. And even toward the end of his disease, he thanked people that helped him, me and people that helped me. One time, one of my helpers was struggling to get him to, uh, take a shower, and after they finished, St 
Steve looked at her and told her thank you. The person that distributes medication at the assisted living where he was told me that he was the only one that told her thank you when, he gave medic when she gave him medication. I think his mother would have been proud. Would you join me in a moment of prayer? The God that we know and we see love and commitment and family, that all abiding love that holds all of us. Hold Stephen Anthony Campo, Steve Anthony Campo. Hold his family, hold his friends. Hold his loved ones. Hold every person he helped make music in this world. Help them to be at peace. Help them to know that he was loved. Help them to let him live on through them. As we welcome Steve into the, as another person we name as an ancestor. May his life convince us to be more loving and more kind, to make a more just and peaceful world. Amen. So we're going to do a little litany. Um, I'll ask you to respond with, we will remember him. So in the rising of the sun and it's going down, in the blowing of the wind and the chill of winter, in the opening of buds and the rebirth of spring, in the blueness of sky and the warmth of summer, in the rustling of leaves and the beauty of autumn. Every baseball season. When we cook food better than we should. 
when we help the world have more music in it. When we are weary and in need of strength. So long as we live, he too shall live. Steve Anthony Campo's body has given all that it can. It allowed him to walk this earth for more than 80 years. And now it has been given over to the purifying flame. At some point later, his ashes will be scattered at his favorite fishing spot. And while his life here has ended, his impact will live on through each of you through people you'll never meet in ways we can never comprehend. Amen. between our first cry and our last breath. We string together precious moments of life as pearls on a string. Then something or someone breaks the strand and the pearls scatter everywhere. And we are on our knees on the floor trying to retrieve something that was precious and is now lost. A human life cannot be restrung but we can gather together the precious memories in deep gratitude for the time we did have together. I refuse to believe that God is cruel. That is a human failing. Instead, I trust that nothing is ever lost. All past and present make up this moment. Go in peace. Go in love. Amen.